Hello and uh, welcome to the World Built Environment Forum webinar series. Uh, my name is Anil Sahani and I work for the RICS in the construction and infrastructure sector. I'm also a fellow of the RICS. My role primarily centers around, centers around knowledge and practice gathered from our members, for our members relating to construction and infrastructure globally. Today's webinar is in partnership with HKA. Today we'll be discussing risk management and the giga projects of the Middle East, which I think is a very timely topic, a very interesting topic. And luckily we have an excellent set of speakers and panel members who are gonna help us uh, with the discussion today. So before I get started, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to this topic. I looked up the definition of a giga project but I only could find a definition of a mega project. So that tells you the changing times. So as per the Oxford Handbook of Mega Projects Management, mega projects are large scale complex ventures that typically cost about a billion dollars or more, take many years to develop and build, involve multiple public sector and private sector stakeholders, and generally are considered transformational and impact a million or more people. So you can imagine what a giga project could look like. In fact, we are seeing many examples of these types of projects in the Middle East. Some of the programs and projects in Saudi Arabia deal with investments that probably are gonna run into trillions of dollars, impact thousands of square kilometers, change regions, transform many, many lives. These giga projects are massive in scale, as you can imagine. One of the projects that's frequently talked about globally is Neom, which is estimated to have an investment of over half a trillion dollars, uh, about 9 million residents expected by 2045, and impact about 14 or 15 different sectors, including design and construction, education, tourism, and many more. So the key differentiator, therefore, if you're talking about gear projects, is really the outcomes that are, that are expected uh, and the transformation that's expected from these projects. Uh, these projects are expected to transform the region and provide social, economic, and out environmental outcomes. Uh, a lot more importance, therefore, probably needs to be given uh, to these outcomes when we consider risk and managing these projects. And it is therefore important to consider how these benefits are realized and ensure that these outcomes are met. So if you look at the recent RICS Global Construction Monitor Survey of Q1 2023, Middle East actually continues to return upbeat headline conditions evidenced by the RICS construction activity index that's coming uh, at an average of about plus 25, which is the sort of unchanged from the Q4 2022, and therefore remains consistent with the solid backdrop across the region. KSA has the highest, globally the highest construction activity index as measured by RICS with UAE at number four. Obviously there are some slowdown scene, especially in Qatar post the World Cup. Some of the challenges outlined in the GCM survey also tell you the size and scale of these projects. Um, the respondents to the survey that RICS runs every quarter includes skill shortages, competition for materials and resources in the region, and the capacity of the performing entities. You can get some of these clues on the challenges with these giga projects from the recent HKA Crux report, as well as the 2022 Middle East Capital Projects and Infrastructure Survey. So the top three areas of urgency are hiring and retaining high-skilled employees, which about 48% um, respondents mentioned as the top urgent issue. Then developing accurate cost estimates and forecasts for their projects about 47% respondents, and to our panel members and myself, this clearly uh, requires input from quantity surveyors and cost managers, and then creating a suitable governance and risk management processes 
came at number three with about 37 percent of the respondents mentioning that so we have an excellent panel of experts who are going to help us discuss these issues in detail so let me take this opportunity to now introduce our panel of members first and foremost is amanda clark who's a fellow of the rics a good friend for about 10 years now she's partner regional ceo of emia uh, at hka she's past president of rics and a humongous ambassador and mentor for all of us amanda thank you anil it's fantastic to to be with you um again today and really looking forward to um sharing the platform with some great speakers under your chairmanship so uh yeah, exciting hour ahead of us. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, next uh, panel member is Hussam Gavish, who is really based on the ground. As you can see, our panel members are spread. Amanda is in the UK. I'm uh, speaking to you from the US. Hussam is on the ground. He's the expert. He's uh, the partner and head of operations for Saudi Arabia at HKA. Welcome, Hussam. Thank you very much, uh, Anil, uh, for this introduction. Um, it's a real privilege and um, uh, honor to be on this um, uh, panel today. Um, looking forward to it. Exciting times. Thank you, Sam. Next but not least is Adele Oyakanmi, a fellow of the RICS. He's senior manager of contracts and commercial for Neom, the man who's dealing with all these risk management, commercial management and project management issues on the ground. He's also a member of our standards and regulation board. And we really thank Dele for all your contributions to RICS. To this webinar, I know we also asked you to run a panel and a presentation during our global construction and infrastructure conference. I'm delighted to have you on the panel. Thank you, Arnel. It's, it's great to be with um, the panel, and I look forward to our thoughtful and fruitful discussions this afternoon. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be a breeze for me because we have experts, and all I got to do is be a glorified timekeeper and a person who speaks the least on, on this group. So we're going to jump right into our first question. Uh, we, for our audience, have this on the <clears throat> slides. Um, but before I move forward, I'd like to invite your active involvement. We have participants from about 49 countries represented today. Um, close, over 400 people have registered for this webinar. So please do submit your questions to our panel as it really helps bring the conversation to life. If you are new to these webinars, you should see that you can submit questions at any time using the question box on your screen. We'll pick up as many questions as we go through the session. We will also dedicate a few minutes at the end of the session to answer these questions. But we promise to you that we will uh, write a summary of all those questions and make those available to all those who have registered on our website and through a follow-up uh, <clears throat> email also so moving to our first question and this is going to be really a question where i'd like the panel members to take a few minutes to sort of give an opening statement connect your backgrounds your current work and your organization to what's happening on the ground so the first question <clears throat> is really to get the conversation started i'm going to request amanda then Hussam and Dele to help us uh, with this question what are the principal considerations for project sponsors and project teams wishing to proactively manage risk on giga projects? Amanda. Thanks, Anil. Um, you mentioned our crux report at HKA, and I'm, I'm gonna start there if I might, because um, the report came out at the end of 2022. It's our fifth report and it's called Battling Headwinds. What that does is actually it's um, looked at over 1,600 projects in over 100 countries um, and a capex of 2.13 trillion. And I think this is really relevant in terms of helping us to, to have some data behind the, the question that you've posed us here. What it's basically selling at, telling us is that capital projects are still facing significant overruns in costs and delivery. Where well, you could say, well, so what, what's new? We've been kind of living with that for so long. Um, but when I tell you that the total claims analysed um, total at over 80 billion in value, um, it 
and the cumulative overruns that we've looked at come up to 840 years, um, that gives you the scale of the, the problem that we're facing. So really it's what do we need to be doing about it in terms of how we then manage that risk. Well, I think there's basically three key areas that um, it's important to focus on, particularly in the context of giga projects. Um, firstly, around contract interpretation. And the key thing here is, you know, how do we use standard forms of contract that are well understood by the market? I think that's incredibly important. Um, it's important that the risk allocation within those contracts is well balanced and that effectively um, that risk has been allocated and the expectations and accountabilities are well understood. And, and just the advice really there um, around project sponsors is to try and avoid late payments as these obviously materially affect contractors who are going to have significant cash flow tied up in these big projects. The second point I'd say is around design failings and that came through um, our um, report findings. And really this is simply about allowing enough time for design um, and for this to be done where possible using technologies that really help sort of think things through. Um, the designs need to be frozen and analysed for errors such that the gaps before construction are really well understood and therefore can be fixed. So the message here I think is get the design complete and make sure it's on time, i.e. not late, um, and it aligns with the pace of the construction. And the third point I'm going to mention, my final point in this context, is changes in scope. Um, I think we all know that there are going to be changes in scope, so let's look to minimise those where we can by investing that time up front. But where they do occur, let's make sure that they're well managed and that these are done in conjunction with the project teams. Late approvals are notorious for um, causing issues further downstream. I think the only other thing I'd say on this, Anil, is you know it's really important and beneficial if you can get that early contractor involvement because in many ways that actually helps preempt many of the design and other conflicts by getting their insight um, early on. Just finally then to kind of close from my perspective, worth mentioning that from the Crux report, the Middle East are the worst globally for delays. So that's one definitely to look out for with 83.1% of um, scheme duration being um, affected. So my top tip um, would be for um, effectively for project sponsors, project teams to set up a dispute advisory board from day one. Um, I think that's in, an incredibly proactive way of taking things forward so that if things do go wrong, rather than adversarial approach, you actually start by bringing people together to problem solve together. Um, and I think that's, you know, incredibly important for these um, giga projects. So the key messages, I think, are allow sufficient time, um, make sure that you're working collaboratively and um, using sort of recognised forms of contract. Excellent. Uh, Amanda, that's an excellent way to start. Hussam, over to you uh, on the same question. Oh, thank you, Anila, and thank you, Amanda. Um, I think Amanda covered quite a lot of uh, very important points there, I and mean, she she referenced our uh, our crux report. Um, and again, um, the um, um, the design issues and the change orders are amongst the top uh, causation of disputes in in in, in, in Saudi. Uh, but that also extends to uh, lack of cash flow in, in in the market and 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 site accessibility before projects are. Uh, are awarded. So again, these are two other issues that um, once you know the causation of these disputes in, in the kingdom and work work towards avoiding them, I think uh, that limits the risks. And um, so rather than being reactive to these problems, um, once we know what these problems are, we are in a better position to be proactive and, and, and avoid these matters. And I think also um, uh, there are other issues that need to be considered, and I think top 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 amongst those, in my opinion, is the careful consideration of um, the procurement of contractors, making sure you have the right team on the ground to deliver the project. Um, I think we, we we need to focus on experience, on the capacity of these pro contractors, and also on their financial stability, and, and maybe try to shift a little bit away from you know, um, the lowest price wins uh, culture and make sure we have the right the right delivery partners on the ground. Um, 
collaboration is something Amanda mentioned. I think that's something we're seeing a lot of these days. The um, the uh, early involvement of contractors, making sure the contractors are phased into the project, um, uh, coming in at, at an early stage, stress testing the designs, making sure the designs are are correct, um, 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 talking to uh, issues such as um, interfacing with other packages, the buildability of the project. Once the pro once the contractor has the opportunity to be partnering with the employer at the early stages, then it, it only goes to ensure that delivery is going to be um, um, smooth. Um, and, and, and we'd like to see more, and this is happening and we're seeing it, more and more proactive employers helping the contractors uh, um, with, 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 with the delivery of the projects. The one team mentality, which we sadly didn't have much of in the past, and I think we are moving uh, a bit more towards that slowly, but, but, but surely. Um, and just a final point I'd like to make is the, um, the project team itself, within all the stakeholders and at all levels, making sure you have the right skill sets um, in the right places, in the right positions, uh, with the right experience. And that, I think, is paramount to making sure, uh, again, uh, we reduce the risk and ensure the delivery of these projects uh, are done in, in the right way. So these are just some of the points we we we, we think are important. Well, thank you so much, Hussam. I really <clears throat> the key word that I picked up from you was collaboration, and I think wrong. It's so true, on la especially on large projects, as Amanda said, early contractor involvement, and then having the trust and collaboration in the project team. Over to you, Delay. What are your thoughts about uh, proactively, especially from a project sponsor's point of view, managing some of these risks? Well, thank you very much, Anil and Amanda and Hussam. I don't want to say um, that uh, Hussam and Amanda have taken some of my key points in this discussion, but I would uh, continue um, from where they stopped. I think for me, um, the key thing, uh, the, and I'm going to speak about three key issues, um, which I believe are very important. Uh, the first one is uh, teamwork. I like what John Maxwell said when he says in one of his books, teamwork makes the dream work. And um, it's very important and crucial that as we enter into these phases of giga projects construction, that we understand that behaviors are one of the most critical um, points that we look at. Um, some time ago, we were doing a seminar and we were looking at the various factors that uh, actually make a project work and what goes wrong on projects. And we found that it wasn't actually cost, it wasn't um, uh, estimates, it wasn't project management systems, it was actually the behaviors of the team. Um, and so that is very important. We have to shift, I believe, from our old behaviors um, and come together to work as a team. I remember many years ago when I was in London working on a partnering project and we uh, had to shift from a client and the contractor um, mindset and we were able to come together and work as one team where you have the contractor taking on some roles that the client would effectively do, but it was a project a partnering team and uh, we were able to successfully deliver that project as a matter of fact it was one of the projects that was highlighted in the housing forum back in the late 90s so i believe that um, behaviors are very important um, we need to work as a team we need to have a different mindset if we're going to deliver these projects they're going to be successful um, the, the behaviors of of the team are very very important I think the second um, consideration for me would be on governance. Governance is very important um, um, to manage risk. We need to have a very solid and robust governance policy in place. Uh, I believe this is sincerely because of the amount of money we're spending. We're spending, as, we, as, we've, as we've heard, is not, is not a billion, it's multi-billion projects. And therefore, if we don't have robust governance policies and processes in place, we're going to return back to the previous um, um, mindset and shifts, which of course delays projects. 
Um, so we need, in order to be to, to have effective collaboration, you've got to have effective um, governance in place. Um, and that needs to start from the beginning of the project, not when the project is halfway or midway. It has to be set up from the beginning, from the onset, and these need to be documented and cascaded down as we go along during the course of the project. Um, the third consideration, which I think um, we've touched on, but I wanted to highlight it in a different way, is the skilled resources. We know that one of the key issues or one of the key risks we, we face in the Middle East is not having enough resources for our projects. And um, we're going to have to look at this in a different way, perhaps getting um, um, more remote working for uh, resources abroad in order to work on these giga projects. I sincerely believe that with what we're doing, um, in particular, for instance, in, in, in um, the Middle East, we will need more hands on deck. And to have more hands on deck, you need more resources. And those resources physically may not be here in the Middle East. We may have to reach out to um, other continents and other countries abroad. And that will have to happen within the new concept of hybrid working, where people are now not willing to work physically anymore on projects, but can work um, remotely and can do it effectively. So those are my three considerations. Thank you very much, Anel. Thank you, Delhi. I think that was an amazing start to our webinar. Before moving further, in fact, in my limited experience, this is the first time we've received several questions uh, from the audience so much up front. So the first question, and we're going to keep it brief so that we can go to our next uh, set of questions as well, or prompts as well. And this, these, uh, either Hussam or Delhi, if you can help me address this question from the audience about unrealistic schedules we all know this this is a pretty common issue of optimism bias we tend to uh, <clears throat> overplay the benefits and sometimes underestimate the issues the challenges or the risks that we may face how much of the delays that amanda pointed out or possibly on these giga projects are due to the schedules being unrealistic shall i shall i go really go yeah, ahead, sure. Actually, that's a very, very good question, Anil, and it was a point I was uh, intending to make, um, which slipped my mind, um, making sure from the outset that we have realistic, achievable construction programs um, uh, right from the outset. And what we find in, in, in Saudi in particular is we have all these mega projects and giga projects and massive programs that are done all at once um, rather than being phased out in, 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 in in, 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 in stages uh, uh, and deliver them in stages because often there is a lot of pressure on deadlines and times and making sure these projects are delivered uh, um, on this date and that date. And what, what then inevitably happens is uh, the, the, the contractors, the employers, they are forced to accept a program that from the get-go, everyone knows is not achievable, but it's just ticking the box uh, to begin with and, and sorting, out, sorting it out later, which inevitably leads to delays and disputes and so on. So I think what needs to change is, is, is we need to have um, a long and hard look at the project, making sure uh, that the what, what we tell the contractor to do and what the contractor says he can do is actually um, is, is, is achievable. And that can only be done, the collaboration point, can only be done by collaborating uh, there's a strong collaboration between all the stakeholders right from the beginning. The, the, the one team, one project, one success mentality, rather than creating uh, creating um, a toxic environment right from the beginning when everyone knows it's not achievable. So very good question. I think we're seeing this shifting, and I think this is where we, we need to continue pushing to build um, and, and and this is also slightly linked, sorry to, to, to keep going on it, but I think this is slightly linked to the, the lowest price mentality again, because everyone wants to win the project and, and, and they're saying, you know, we'll do it in two years rather than three years. Here's, here's a program, my price is lower and therefore um, I can deliver and, and it's not going to be delivered. So we need to accept that this is not the case and deal with it up front. Delhi, any comments on that question? 
I would also want to want to add that uh, we know from history of um, mega projects in the Middle East um, that delays do come from a certain mindset and behaviors which I mentioned earlier on. Uh, we are shifting from that. We are we are moving forward from that. But I think transparency is key. Um, as chatted surveyors, for instance, we know that that is part of our role. And um, we have to give the client what we believe they need to, to understand is right and correct, right from the beginning. It's not what they want to hear, it's what is going to be realistic and acceptable. We, they may not want to hear it, they may not want to accept it, but that is what is going to happen because um, we understand, and also from what Amanda said, we've, got, we've had a huge history. We have a huge history of delays in the Middle East. One of the one of the worst in the world, and uh, the only way I believe this is going to change is to actually come to the table right from the beginning, all um, participants and uh, stakeholders of the project, to understand that look, there, there is a risk from the beginning, and that that stems also from the fact that a lot of projects try to um, ignore the risk registers. It's just like a tool or a document that's just been, has to be put onto the table. But it has to be a proactive document. It's a document that needs to be taken seriously from day one. And also for sponsors and clients to, to take it seriously when their advisors, their project planners, the project controls, project managers are advising them on, the, on their schedule. Um, we we are paid or um, consultants are paid to do a huge amount of work and to advise the client on what they need to achieve. And if they only want to hear what they what they want to hear, that's what the consultants will continue to do. But if our, if there's an open door for transparency, honesty, and it is what it is, then we're going to move on. And that is the way we're going to achieve. Um, constructing a lot of these giga projects, in my opinion, it has to be transparent, it has to be open. We have to accept that um, it's not going to be done within the times and the frameworks which we want to. And they also, we also need to understand that they're barriers. We don't have everything. A, a, a simple example is what I said earlier on about resources. Um, we have to we, we're going to move things with people. People um, need to manage these projects, and we don't have all, all of that here. So um, it's very crucial that the schedules are taken seriously, and that schedule needs to be on the risk register from day one, managed, taken ownership. Take, there must be an owner of that um, schedule, and it must be a proactive document. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, before moving forward, Amanda, there's a trick question for you, not from me, from the audience. Uh, <clears throat> and it relates to early contractor involvement. So the question is, it's important, but how do we guard against the contractor manipulating this to bake in the likelihood of later changes, conflicts to boost the bottom line? I guess we know the answer. It's about trust and transparency. Love to hear your thoughts. I think, um, and it is, it's about trust and transparency. It's about that magic word. I think Hassan mentioned collaboration and then Delhi around teamwork. So I think, you know, kind of um, putting the contract, having a good contract and then putting it in the drawer, um, locking the drawer and working um, so, so that people solve the issues. I think that's um, the really key point. But also, um, you know, making sure that with the, contractor that you're actually you're challenging some of the assumptions that they've got in there so that you've got a good team around you that can um that can work together but also challenge the assumptions so that you're really making sure that you're getting something that is realistic i mean you know it's been mentioned in the the answer to the previous question i think you know a huge dose of realism in terms of um setting those costs and um program um, out at the outset so that you actually know what the estimates are and um, you know what's realistically achievable and then obviously it's about working together but also driving the project to um, to conclusion as well. Thank you so within my limited experience moderating I've never seen so many questions come in and I, honestly I can't keep up <laughs> so we'll definitely have to do a blog or an article later. I'm going to move to our next question which is um, I request Delhi to get us started with that question. 
what additional pressures do professionals working to minimize risk face in the early phases of the projects? Um, obviously, others can chime in as well. Dele, if you can get us started with that. Well, I think we've mentioned it, but just to um, reiterate again what we said earlier on, um, the key pressures, of course, are deadlines, working to unrealistic deadlines. Um, we want to achieve so much within a certain period of time. Um, we've announced that pro probably to, to, the, to the general public, and that kind of put, that does put pressure on the professionals to, to deliver. Um, again, in order to minimize the, those um, the, the, those risks, I, I believe it's um, knowing what we have, what resources do we have, what's our time frame, what cost estimates do we have, do we have the right design in place, um, what design deadlines do we have, and also the approvals. Um, I, I, in my experience, I've um, witnessed the fact that we, we do forget the bigger picture. Um, we sometimes stay within our own mini project, if I can say, and forget that we have to rely on a lot of other additional stakeholders to get approvals, to get things through the door, either that be finance from banks, either be approvals from local authorities, either be um, on on expected events like COVID-19 that we had, um, all these kind of risks are quite important because these put additional pressure on on professionals, and um, it's it, it's worth taking that into consideration. I like um, uh, one of my projects we did when we were doing, for instance, in um, in um, on, on my MBA, uh, when we looked at uh, the model of um, SWOT and also, the, and also the, the, the pest. And one of the areas we look at in the pest is the, the, the internal and the external factors. In most cases, a lot of projects I've worked on, a lot of these um, risk and pressures are looked at internally. And we need to look at what's going on externally, because if we don't, then we're going to have these kind of risks that unexpected risks come up and we're going to find more pressure on, on our workforce. So I think it's important that we look at what do we have internally, what's happening internally, but most importantly in these days, what is happening externally. Um, and that is going to minimize the pressure. That's going to minimize the risk that I believe we have in the early phases of our projects. Thank you, Dele. That was excellent. Anyone else want to comment on that question before we move on? I was, just, I was just going to say, um, Anil, just to build on sort of Dele's point very briefly, I think um, you know, the, the biggest risk is the unpredictability of the unknown, um, and that's always the most difficult risk to forecast, um, you know, where there's disruption in the world and, um, you know, things like the pandemic, um, material price hikes, inflation, you know, they have um, a massive impact, particularly on fixed price contracts. and. You know, who can predict what the next 10 years uh, will hold? I certainly think going back 10 years, we would none of us have predicted the pandemic at the scale and the level that it impacted everything. But throughout that, actually, construction was so um, capable of actually kind of continuing, um, maybe not at the pace we would have all liked, but actually, you know, managed to keep going through that. So, um, and, and actually, I think people really kind of came together and um, looked at different ways of working, which is, um, you know, kind of creates innovation on, on projects as well, which is you know, the size and scale of giga projects. There's you know, a likelihood that there's going to be something that we won't have seen that's going to kind of come through. So I think trying to think things through using experience, um, but also sort of like, you know, um, looking at the arts are possible when you're actually assessing that risk is quite key. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Before moving forward, I'm going to again put you guys on the spot here a little bit. The question from the audience is, can you give a couple of, and this may be Hussam and Dele, Dele first and then Hussam, specific actions or examples. These could be relating to partnering, to contracts, to procurement, but the audience is looking for our participants are looking for maybe a couple of examples that work in the region. Dele, would you like to go first? In terms of, in terms of partnering, I've, 
I've, I've not uh, worked on any partnering project um, my well, 15, 16 years now in the Middle East. Um, I don't think that's really common. Um, I think that's uh, an area that we can uh, look into, especially for our um, uh, Giga projects. I sincerely believe, as I said earlier on, that is one of the um, contract um, and procurement routes that would really suit what we're doing at the moment, bringing in contractors and clients, uh, consultants at an early stage, Having that collaborative approach, um, I believe, is very important, and I would want to see more of partnering on our projects here in the Middle East. Okay. So, who saw many specific examples? Um, I, I think, like like Delhi, I can't think of any specific sort of successful partnering examples that I've seen. But I, I think the point here is this is where we're trying to head in in in. In, in, in Saudi now with, with all these Giga projects and, and the PIF companies in particular are, are and I know that from experience and, and in some of the projects we are working on, that there is a real appetite and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and actions are being taken to bring the, the stakeholders together um, and to partner and collaborate. So this is where we're heading and this is where we were not before. And that, I think this is why this, um, discussion is so important. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to our um, next question, and that's um, jointly going to be handled first by Amanda and then perhaps Dele uh, on our question three. And the question three really talks about the what kind of talent should businesses involved in these projects be recruiting for early on, all three of you, mentioned that that's going to be a big challenge getting uh, chartered professionals or professionals who have experience and expertise to handle issues and challenges of these large scale projects what kind of talent do you think would be needed on these projects amanda and then Dele? i think first of all a lot of it um and and secondly you want the best talent you know they deserve giga projects deserve having the best talent. I think in order to achieve a lot of resource and um, attracting the best, I like what Dele said about, you know, the needs to kind of like, how do we use technology to maybe help um, gain greater access to that, that talent pool um, that might not even be based in, say, the Middle East, but could actually be accessible globally. But ultimately, I think the requirement is a blend of three things. You want experienced experts that bring their knowledge and experience. Um, you know, that's absolutely key. So we're learning from um, the knowledge of, of what's happened in the past. I think there's a huge opportunity also to bring in, secondly, innovative, bright professionals that bring that fresh perspective and new ways of doing things. I think that's incredibly important that we have that balance. And then I think the, the third area is about having the best and brightest of the local talent pools, um, you know, that exist within country um, that understand the legacy and will really benefit from the delivery because they too bring a very unique perspective. So I think what you want is this blend of the, of the three kind of coming together so that you're looking at how can you problem solve, how can you drive innovation? And also, how can you find new ways to solve old problems? Because I think the one thing Giga projects have is scale. And wouldn't it be fantastic if we could kind of find new ways of, of building maybe not the, the Giga projects, but maybe mega projects or just very large projects on the back of having really innovated um, and using the scale of the Giga projects to do it. I think the other thing is, you know, many people will kind of get involved in these Giga projects and they'll be um, career enhancing, they are once in a lifetime projects that you're going to get involved with. Um, and, you know, for actually, yeah, Anil, you and I have been very involved, particularly with young professionals. You know, what an exciting opportunity to talk about the next generation to come in and get involved in projects like this. But I think, um, you know, the kind of like the comment I would say is that to get that best and brightest talent, wherever it's going to come from or however you're going to. Um, focus it for these kind of projects, it's going to require extra effort at the outset to mm -hmm. um, ahead of that contract award to make sure that you've got the right people that are suitably qualified and have like the right risk management expertise. 
um, and, and recognizing that there's actually, you know, there are shortages, particularly in the built environment sector at a global level. So what you've actually got is all of these projects effectively competing one within another um, in order to attract, attract that talent. So we really have got a global war for talent. Um, but also what we need is, you know, the use of technology to help deliver and facilitate, design and enable and share data and information in a way that, that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. So how can we really use that innovation to, to drive and, and lead? And I think that's where, for me, professional bodies like our ICS really do have a key role in helping to deliver that right talent for these projects. As you know, the one great thing is the qualification, I think, gives confidence um, and trust in delivery consistency for clients and employers. But of course, for young professionals, it also gives them that passport of credibility to access these jobs of the future. Um, and Neil, you're involved in universities. I am too. Um, you know, universities have a key role to play to um, feed the innovation in these projects in areas like sustainability. You know, many of these giga projects in the Middle East are um, being built out at carbon neutral with a very strong sustainability environmental um, uh, considerations and you know what we need is the best and brightest minds coming um, and focusing on projects like NEAM um, in countries like KSA um, we need professionals to kind of then have that accreditation and I think that's again an opportunity for professional bodies like RICS to now step up and accredit these courses so that people can actually kind of get qualifications potentially in the future in sustainability within um, surveying um, so that we can really bring the best and brightest minds to to the future so you know how much of a risk to project delivery is a shortage of appropriate skills and experience for these these giga projects well it's it's got to be huge and um, because the projects will or should attract those best and brightest minds but you know how do we get the right people i think hassan you said it you know it's the right people at the right time that are going to come in and set up and deliver these projects in the right way. Um, you know, that sort of initial setup, we need those people now um, on the ground. So I, I think also just to sort of finally say, maybe the last thing to say on this, that, you know, the war for talent begins at the top. And of course, what we also need is entrepreneurial leadership um, that sets the vision, the purpose and the drive to deliver through that collaboration. Um, you know, Dele, you talked about you know, the kind of like the importance of teamwork and culture that has to be set at the, the top in projects. And I think, you know, we also need in our war for talent um, argument, we also need great leaders that are going to come in and, and lead and facilitate these these incredibly large projects. So I think it's, you know, it's an exciting time um, to kind of come together on these giga projects. And I my hope for the future is that we look back on this period and say, that this was the moment when the game was changed in the way that we actually look at delivery. But Delhi, I'm I'm sure you've got some points to add on that. Yeah, well, fantastic, uh, Amanda. Thank you for that. I I think uh, for me, uh, what kind of talent should businesses um, involved in these projects be recruiting for? I think we should start with local talent. We mustn't forget here that in the Middle East we have um, quite a lot of if I may say, hungry uh, professionals from the from the local um, local um, pool of professionals who want to get into various roles in the construction um, industry. Um, that I believe, whether they are whether they come from the construction background or not, I think we should be looking to recruit more of local talent that we can coach and mentor. Uh, professionals like ourselves who have been in the industry for over 20 to 30 years. That should be our role now. We should be in the role of defined leadership. We should be in the role of coaching um, local um, um, recruits and local talent. We should be in the in the in the um, process of bringing more minds into the industry that probably not, are not even um, construction, with no construction background. So I think um, we shouldn't limit ourselves just to construction professionals, but we should be looking for local talent, local, local um, professionals who want to come into the construction industry and we can coach and mentor them. 
as um, Amanda rightly said, that is the generation of tomorrow. We're not going to be here in the next 20 years. We have to be realistic. Who is going to take over from where we are today? It's going to win, and we need to uh, pass on what we have, that knowledge we have, onto the on, onto the local um, for local talent. So I think that's very important. I think also for me, in, for the role of the universities, um, it's um, embedding the uh, the new systems, the new technology like BIM and uh, sustainability into the curriculum. I think that's very important. Um, I also believe that we should not also look at the university academic routes. There are a lot of talent within the um, vocational um, experience route, for instance. We were talking about this recently at the Standard Regulations Board, where um, we were saying we should try and move away. Well, not try and move away, but we shouldn't forget that there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of hidden talent within um, uh, uh, within uh, professionals who don't go down the academic route. And those kind of people, I believe, should be given the opportunity to work on these GIGA projects. Um, I know here in the Middle East, there are requirements that you need a first degree to come into one of the um, GCC countries to work. But I think as we move on, in order to achieve these um, GIGA projects, we're going to have to um, open that net a little bit wider. And to open that wider, you, you need people, not only from the academic background, but also from other routes, like from MVQ, vocational training, and from the experience route. Um, that is important. That can be for the experts. So for me, it's local talent, defined leadership, and um, opening the net wide also for other um, professionals to come in. Some excellent points. I think uh, we're going to move on to our next question. That's for Hussam, uh, and it talks about essentially the importance of uh, strategies that are needed to ensure benefits realization and achieving project outcomes. To me, um, a giga project really at the end of the day is going to be measured not by project management success, but program and project success. How well did that deliver on the promise of the benefits and the outcomes? And these could primarily be social, economic, but also environmental or sustainability related. So some, especially looking forward, what strategies should be put in place now to ensure that, that those benefits are realized? Thanks, Anil. I think I think you mentioned there the um, um, the, the social um, and economic benefits. I think for me, um, and we're seeing this for the again uh, the way things are changing. We're seeing quite a lot of focus and and and, and interest in the sort of the social aspect of these projects. Um, it, you know, the economic benefits are clear. Uh, the kingdom is really on a on, on on fast track, opening up to the world. There's a lot of interest, a lot of um, 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 focus. Uh, fantastic, uh, one of a kind projects, as mentioned before, which will really boost the economy of of this country. But I think from the social side, I'm really pleased to see that we're seeing more than ever um, um, active community outreach programs are being adopted by by the uh, the giga projects um, uh, themselves in engaging with local communities and, and bringing them along the journey i think this not only fulfills you know csr responsibilities but um, the communities brought on board from day one the local communities brought on board from from the from day one there's a buy-in into these projects um, there's a huge community awareness of what is being built and why it's being built, which is uh, which is very 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 good and excellent. And I think in a way this mitigates the delays that could happen on projects when you have everyone on board understanding what's being done and why it's being done, and 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 the sheer change that is bringing to the country. I think that's um, that's very valuable. Um, there's also a lot of project accountability and clear measurable KPIs that are being Placed by the employers to measure the social and economic success of these projects, um, to make sure that they are achieving what, what needs to be achieved, um, and these are these are slowly but surely being implemented. I think we we touched um, we touched earlier on the previous question on on the local uh, localization issue and the local talent. I think ten years ago, I would say contractors 
used to treat Saudization or the uh, engagement or employment of, of local Saudi talent as, as a tick, tick, tick the box exercise. Um, but I, this is now changing and, and, and we're seeing uh, Saudi talent being brought on board on, on, on merits, um, on um, very talented young professionals are, are entering the market. And there is an obligation, I think, to, to take them on, to train them, to, to bring them along the journey um, um, that, that these Gaga projects are taking us on. Um, um, a lot better than, I think expats have, 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 have delivered a lot, but inevitably expats finish their work and go back home. And the, I think for me, the way local talent is being brought on board is, is very refreshing. I think this is the only way we can uh, proceed. And, and, and I think this contributes to the, um, to the, to the great image these GEGA projects are having in, in, in the various sectors they're, they're, they're working on. So I think these, these are all important points. I think the, um, the, the um, moving forward, this, um, you will slowly see the, the taking over by local, local talent on, on, on the, and the ownership of these projects. I think the environmental, the environmental factors are important. I think there's a lot of um, um, care being put into the environmental uh, issues that may arise from these projects. We're, we're seeing risk management um, strategies being placed for, for, for environmental um, impacts. Um, contractors are looking into their ECG uh, policies and procedures. So whilst there could be short-term impacts on the environment, I think the long-term um, or, or the end goal for the long-term is, is, is a positive impact on the environment moving forward. We're seeing this in the NEON projects and various other projects that are uh, being implemented. So uh, I think these are really good policies and procedures that are being put in place, particularly on the social side of it, things. Thank you, Sam. I think that was very valuable. We're going to move on to our next question which relates to technology. As I've mentioned previously, the 2022 Middle East Capital Projects and Infrastructure Survey, the respondents talked about upgrading technology and tools as a possible uh, way to modernize the capacity and the capability of the sector. So this question really relates to the role of digital construction in Industry 4.0 <clears throat> that would play in the delivery of these giga projects. I've spoken to a few other experts working on these projects and um, in relation to a book that I've written on Construction 4.0. And it really showcases the importance of keeping this in mind as we deliver giga projects. So Delhi, first to you uh, on the general role of digital construction and uh, industry 4.0 technologies. And then Amanda, I think you have a lot of experience with BIM and related initiatives, your views on what role they can play on giga projects. Well, I, I think uh, first and foremost, the, and I think we will we'll all agree with this, that um, digital construction is the way to go. Um, we can't uh, use the old methods. I remember when we used to use cotton shuffle to put our bill of quantities together many years ago. Um, that has gone and those days will never come back. But we're now in the era of um, BIM. Uh, we're now in the era of using other um, digital tools that can enhance uh, our construction and our um, uh, delivery of projects and, and reports to our clients. I think um, the role they do play, of course, is it's, it's faster, it's quicker, um, but most importantly, they're more, they are reliable. And um, that's because you reduce your risk when you have a, a reference point and it's, it's 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 something that anyone can um, refer to all around the world. As I said earlier on, the way we we are going now in the industry is more of hybrid. You can't work on a giga project in one in one location. You have to be in different locations, and to be in those different locations, you're gonna have you're gonna need the tools to be able to collaborate and talk, just like we're doing now. Um, you're in the United States, and we're here in um, 
in Saudi in, and uh, Amanda in UAE. So imagine if we didn't have one tool that can bring us all together at the same time. It's the same thing we need for our cost estimates, for instance, um, using more effective um, cost um, estimating um, um, software, um, using BIM, using other um, tools that are faster, reliable, and can help us leverage our projects. So for me, I think um, the role it does play is to um, enable us to, to work faster, bring us together um, in one place, and to help us achieve our goals quicker, and to deliver to our clients in a more proactive manner. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you. Um, I think just to add to it, I mean, I think it's you know it's exciting that projects like Neom are seeking to to build a net zero carbon city. Um, you know, that's kind of ambitious in itself, and and doing that from scratch is, is kind of like really an incredible ambition, which epitomises, I think, the visionary ambition and the Saudi commitment to diversify the economy, whilst also exploiting the use of modern technologies. And, you know, the Vision 2030 and also UAE's master plan for 2040 should really help kind of give us the initiatives and the ambition to drive that investment in digital information management and, and also to focus on training around capital projects and infrastructure using 4.0 and BIM. Um, you know, developers, contractors and consultants should be encouraged to invest in that technology, use digitalization on the mega and giga projects um, and other complex works, because their sheer scale really enables that significant investment to happen and pay dividends on during the life of the, the project and really stretch the current capabilities all the more poignant when you think of that war for talent we talked about earlier. But I think, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia in trying to mandate the use of BIM on significant projects is, you know, a really effective way to take things forward. And again, to really sort of leave a legacy around sort of like investment in BIM technology. And what you also need is really strong client leadership in that, in terms of saying, this is the way we're going to do it. These are the standards you have to adhere to and how we're going to use technology going forward. So um, I think there's huge hope and huge opportunity around the role of digital construction and Industry 4.0 in delivering giga projects of the future. Thank you, Dele and Amanda. I'm already getting comments on the metaverse, use of AI and so on. But we're going to move on to our next question. Now, some next question really relates to the interface between risk management and procurement routes. In your view, what are some of the uh, risk allocation sharing that's being managed on these giga projects in the Middle East? Uh, what kind of new approaches are being considered? Sorry, I fell in the mute trap again. <laughs> um, I think if you look back at um, and how contracting was done about 10 years ago. I think most um, developers were, were, were mainly government-led ministries and agencies. Um, they used public work contracts and they had very onerous uh, conditions uh, attached to them. Um, um, for example, uh, in the case of when, when there's non-payment to the contractor, the contractor had no mechanism to suspend uh, their work. There were many financial restrictions around variations um, and, and that made life very very difficult for, for contractors now we're seeing sort of a more balanced approach um, to these type of issues um, 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 PIF companies for example have their own uh, standard form of contracts where there is a lot more risk uh, sharing in, in these contracts um, you know contractors can suspend um, um, it, but you know no one wants a, any project to be suspended but when there are these provisions in the contract, you're sending the right messages uh, uh, to the contractors, um, um, and, and there's more uh, uh, more collaboration or more uh, appetite to 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 to, to work. Um, VOs are, are also treated much better than than they were before. So um, also there are a lot of uh, dispute resolution clauses now in 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 contracts, adaptation of uh, international processes and procedures. Uh, in, in these giga projects, things like uh, 
uh, DABs and, and, and arbitration clauses uh, that are inserted in these um, um, uh, uh, contracts. There is now the um, um, the uh, SCCA, the Saudi uh, Center for Commercial Arbitration, which has been established recently, and by all intents and purposes, it's gaining international recognition as a world-class organization. Having all these all these um, 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 items in, 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 in contracts just helps send the right messages, as I, as I said uh, before. Uh, also, previously, it was very difficult to negotiate uh, contracts. Um, uh, everything was set in stone. Um, FIDIC contracts were amended and they were shoehorned into um, um, public works uh, contracts. And often there was a lot of conflict and, uh, and, and contradiction in these contracts. Again, nowadays we're seeing more and more room for negotiations. There are tough negotiations that take place, but at the end of the day, at least um, these take place and you're mitigating um, uh, risk and, and, and conflict uh, uh, later on. Um, we, we talked already, I'm not going to repeat, I think we talked already about um, um, uh, co early contractor involvement and, and what that means in terms of contractors being involved in the designs and identifying potential issues, buildability of these projects, any clashes uh, with, with other interfacing projects and so on. So all these are contributing factors that lead to resolving as, as many as possible of, 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 of the issues that might arise after the construction starts. So you're doing all that prior to um, uh, construction taking place. And I think one thing that's being overlooked is the, the, the war on talent, and Amanda spoke about talent earlier, the war on talent is not just on people, but actually there is uh, a war on talent on the contractors themselves. There is a visible shortage of contractors in, in the market at the moment. And, in, and, 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 and these em employers with all these fantastic, ambitious GEGA projects uh, have, have so much in the pipeline and there are not enough contractors um, to deliver them. So they are doing what they can, the employers that is, attracting these contractors, making sure that the employers are the employer of choice because somehow the tables might turn or are turning. The contractors actually, we know from experience in Saudi, and I, without naming names, but I know lots of contractors are turning down tenders at the moment. There's just so much on their, so much on their, on their plate that they're picking and choosing carefully which projects to work on. And that really puts pressure on the employers to be that employer of choice. And, and, and so the talent actually works both ways, people and, uh, and, and contractors. So all of these are, are factors con contributing to um, change in procurement uh, models and, 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 and really slowly bringing Saudi in line with um, um, other jurisdictions um, and, 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 and ensuring the successful delivery of these projects. Um, I know we're running out of time. It's a topic that we can talk about, uh, I think, at length, but I think these are just some of the uh, few factors, I think, that are changing. Brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, with a couple of minutes left, um, I think we'll do a very rapid fire closing statement or call to action. I've got to land this plane. So Amanda will Start with you, then over to Delhi, and then Hussam. Your closing statement, call to action. <clears throat> well, I think um, you know, just to say, huge scope for employers in the Middle East. I think to improve um, and move away from sort of like the ingrained insistence, maybe of like the risk transfer to contractors. So just think about the risk profiling differently. Um, an opportunity, I think, to really embrace a more collaborative approach um, and improve those payment terms using standard forms of contract. Um, considering things like early contractor involvement um, and um, you know encouraging better and closer coordination with technology um, around sort of design aspects to make sure that you know there's those conflicts are sorted out early on. Hassan mentioned it as well. You know that dispute advisory board establishing that early at the outset really key, um, and make sure that disputes are addressed so that at the same time the projects can continue. If we can get the basics right now, it's definitely going to help smooth. Um, around aspects such like as escalating tender prices and, and the market under capacity 
to supply. Delay, quick uh, 30 seconds. Okay, my, my takeaway will be this strong leadership and uh, that strong leadership um, is particularly for members of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Um, it doesn't uh, come from your title. It comes from your ability to take responsibility and commitment and to know that we're all in this game together. Risk management is the responsibility of all leaders and all team members. And I would like to see more of our members um, in the Royal Institution of, of Chartered Surveyors take more responsibility in leading a lot of what we have discussed this afternoon, mitigating those risks and taking charge of our projects going forward. Thank you, Dele. Over to you, Some Very quick um, closing. I think a lot, of, a lot has already been said. I think I would just say these are you know, exciting times in, in, in Saudi. I think we're all very privileged to be involved in, in some small way um, in this market at the moment. Uh, um, the eyes of the world are, are, are in Saudi. Everyone everywhere knows about the Giga projects, the fantastic projects that are being delivered, adds to the pressure of people delivering them in, in, in the kingdom. But I would just say, I think the, the key takeaways or the key messages are, I think, strong collaboration, teamwork, realism, being realistic, um, and, and just working together to deliver this ambitious um, program is the only way uh, this 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 is possible um, uh, for the next decade or so. Thank you so much. With this, I'm going to thank Amanda, Hussam, and Dele for your sharing your time and your expertise with our participants. This was a brilliant discussion. I wish we had more time. So with that, I'm going to begin to close this. A reminder that we'll publish a recording and a written summary of this webinar online. We're going to take all the questions. There were many, many questions. We're going to take those and weave those into that written summary. Uh, and do please feel free to share these um, the summary and the recording with your networks. Please take a few moments to let us know what you thought of today's session by completing the online poll, which will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. Um, just a reminder, we have a few more good webinars, conferences coming up. The previous recordings are also available on our website. Um, the ones that you see on your screen, um, digital facilities management, one that I'm excited here happening in New York with NYU, the WBEF uh, Forum Conference, and many more. So these are available on our website. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, where you can receive news of upcoming webinars and catch up on any of uh, the things that you may have missed. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.